have you here, and I know everybody's uh, anxious to hear you, as, as am I, and maybe uh, where we might start is Warren was talking about when you took over the CEO role. It was July of 2020, I believe, so just at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, obviously, uh, difficult times and people trying to get organized, and you're taking on the CEO role at the same time. Uh, fortunately, you've been there for 35 years, so there was uh, not a huge transition, but I'm just curious whether, from a leadership perspective, things had to change as a result of the pandemic, and how did you sort of operate through that time? Well, first of all, congratulations to you. you. I, I show up here being a, a little excited about being in the center of the universe on a Friday afternoon, because I don't, <laughs> I don't get a chance to do that very often, so it's, it's a privilege to have this opportunity and not be beat down in the office today, which I'm excited about, but I'm a bit envious of the circumstances that you're in at, at yes. some level, so congratulations on a great career, and I hope you and fulfill all your dreams as you move into this next chapter of your life. You. So, um, yeah, the, uh, I was asked by somebody, uh, if you knew what you were walking into in July of 2020, would you have taken the job? And um, I think I, the truthful answer is probably not. You know, these things are planned sometime in advance, right? They kind of go on their own course. And uh, it was a unique set of circumstances, not only with the pandemic, but with what the company was going through. And, while I had a fair amount of time with at and I had kind of been off on what I refer to as my sabbatical in the media company for a period of time. And there were parts of the business I was not as intimate with, you know, during that transition that was going on. And so a little bit of it was like almost when I went over to work in media, it was a bit of a half retirement. And then I come back and it's like I have to reacquaint myself with the other part of this business and uh, get myself settled in. It was unsettling. Um, I think, uh, you know, as a person who prided himself on growing up in the operations of the business, knowing people, having a network, you know, going and sitting down at a table and discussing somebody's business with them to be effective, to all of a sudden be isolated someplace um, really was kind of a wake up call. In addition, we had, you know, 140,000 employees all feeling the same thing that many of us felt. They were a little bit off center. They were feeling insecure. They were not clear what was going to happen. So they, they get a new CEO. They're in the middle of a global pandemic. Um, the business is going through a fair amount of change. You can't talk to anybody face to face and kind of put your arm around them. And um, all of a sudden you have to say, I don't have any tools in my toolbox for this. And so you sit down with the management team and you have to start improvising. And, um, you know, we got through it. And I think we got through it, first of all, by making sure we were taking care of employees first and communicating effectively with them and probably over communicating. And in some regards, that got easier because it's a heck of a lot easier to hit, you know, send on a keyboard or to turn up a video conference than it is to get people in an auditorium. It's a little less personal, but you can get a lot of information out. And then secondly, um, being really selective on what the priorities were for the business. And I had to be you know, pretty austere in my thought process on that. New CEO coming in, it's probably not the time to you know, flip everything on its ear when everybody's feeling uncertain about the rest of their lives. So I tried to be pretty disciplined around, here are the three things we need to work on right now. This is what we need to get focused on. We, when we're comfortable, we have those under our belt. Let's move on to the fourth or the fifth. And that worked reasonably well. Now it's frankly the bigger challenge is coming out of that, which is getting people who got to be pretty effective at working virtually and working away from the workplace to say, we can actually be a better business in a different way of operating. Not the way we were operating before the pandemic, but a different way of operating. And um, going through that learning cycle right now will probably be a longer learning cycle than getting uh, engaged in managing through the pandemic. Uh, people are a little bit harder to change because there isn't a crisis around it like there was at the front end of the pandemic where everybody was like, okay, I'm open to do what needs to be done. And we're gonna be going through some cycles on this now. Yeah, it's um, <clears throat> lots of transition. And as you say, I think it was pretty easy for people to rally together because you had to. There was a crisis and people were reacting to that. Now, as you come out of it, I'm kind of curious. A lot of people are always talking about work from home and the challenges of getting people back into the office place. What have your policies been like? How have you uh, dealt with some of that? 
Well, as I said, I don't think we're going back to what we did before. And certainly we're a company that markets and sells technology that facilitates people to do work from any place they are. And um, we do that very well. We use it a lot within our own business. But the way I would characterize it in shorthand inside of our company, I think we maintain things very well virtually. And, and you know we did a very good job of making sure our customers were cared for and that infrastructure was in place and networks functioned. And when all that traffic went home to neighborhoods, it got handled. And when instead of at noontime, all the cellular traffic being in the middle of downtown Boston, it went out to the neighborhoods, we responded and got, we maintain what we do day in and day out pretty well virtually. We don't innovate as well virtually. Um, at least we haven't learned how to do it yet. And so our focus right now is in places and in organizations and in business processes where we know we need to plan, innovate, launch new initiatives, how do we ensure we have the right operating structure in person, people configured the right way, workplaces configured the right way to facilitate that happen. And it's a hybrid environment. I mean, we are not going to be a five day a week at the office kind of place for a lot of jobs. There are some that still are like yours truly. You know, I'm, I tend to be in the office every day or in an office every day and so do some people around me. Uh, but there are others who have the luxury now of maybe working three days a week. And, and now it's building all the structures in the business to say the right people are in all the time on those three days. And we've got the workplace set up in a way that it's flexible enough to make that happen and that we can deal with a hybrid environment. And it means things like you can walk up to a desk and click on and you know you're going to get a video link to somebody who's not present in that particular location. And we're working our way through it. Um, we have parts of the country where we're back at least three days a week to pre-pandemic levels. We have parts of the country that are a solid three, four months behind that in terms of its, uh, its progression. And um, I will let you in on one other secret. I think this is, you know, most of my peers that I talk to, this is what you wake up at two o'clock in the morning thinking about right now. It's this fear of how are you going to keep a cohesive culture and fabric at the workplace? And why do we need to keep a cohesive fabric and culture? Because it's the shorthand to efficiency, effectiveness, and satisfaction. Culture, it's that glue that binds together. And it's not to say that you can't have a culture virtually. We just haven't perfected on how to get it entrenched as fast and as effectively. Maybe over time it happens. But we all want that shorthand. We want that effectiveness. We want that efficiency. We want people to feel like they're, they're belonging. And if you don't have that, you just become a transactional place for somebody to come and collect a paycheck and your business won't be as effective. And it's a, it's a major part of my time right now. Yeah, I think trying to build that culture when people are virtual is very difficult, but also the innovation and the creativity. It's, you really need people together to be able to have that. You know, the pandemic brought uh, a lot of challenges. And one of those big challenges you talked a little bit about um, was around just connectivity and the digital divide, you know, certainly raised challenges in education and health and employment. And um, I know from AT&T's perspective, you guys uh, spend a lot of time on this and a lot of your philanthropic uh, initiatives are around the digital divide. Do you, can you just share a little sure. bit of what you guys have been doing? Yeah, so back to your earlier observation, I walk in at the front of the pandemic in this job and I kind of focus on this notion that I needed to have a few priorities. And one of the things I observed is, you know, we're, we've always been a very active company in our communities and philanthropy and you could go find the initiatives we had in the arts and the initiatives that we had in education and the initiatives we had to help veterans and, you know, on down the line. And I walk in and I said, well, I can only have a few priorities around here and I need to be really clear on what our purpose and mission is. And our purpose and mission was to connect people and to make the business really good at doing that. And we had to define that. And I looked at what we were doing and I said, well, there's a real obvious thing that society is dealing with right now that's a problem. Um, and we all saw it. You know, you get that one person who jumps on the video call that has a really bad connection and they just bring the whole thing, you know, down to a screeching halt. Well, everybody's dealing with them. Or even worse, they couldn't even get on a video call and maybe they had a voice connection and then they're not relevant and participating in the same way. 
and the digital divide dynamic became obvious to many of us every day. And for those of you who have kids at school, in school at home, you know the dynamic that was going on there. And I, I sat there and I looked at it and I said, this seems like it's pretty close to what we do. It seems like a really important societal problem. And it seems like we could focus on that and maybe take away some of these other things and measure whether or not we're actually making progress in this area, making a difference. And um, through some research validated that in fact, we have a bit of authority or credibility to spend some time in this area. When we asked our customers, do you think we're a good broker to talk about this message, to drive policy? It scored very high. And it's not that people don't like us giving money to the arts, but generally speaking, they don't really care about my opinion of what is a good way to spend money in the arts. And I don't know that AT&T is going to move that uh, measurably one way or the other. So it drove this focus, one priority, very tightly linked to what we're doing in the business. That seemed good. And I had a sense that policy-wise, the country was going to be open to some change. Um, and the pandemic just laid it bare for everybody. And suddenly, on a bipartisan basis, we have folks talking about the fact the richest nation on the planet who built the highway systems, who did all the other things for access to healthcare, and you go down the list, has one-fifth of U.S. households that don't have access to scaled internet, and that's a problem. It's a problem for economic opportunity. It's a problem for education equality. It's a problem for access to healthcare. It's a problem for entertainment and enjoyment. And suddenly, the policy moment was right. And so that's what drove us into that. And now we are focused basically on three stools of the policy. There's the issue of adoption, which is do people understand how internet will change their life? Do they know how to use it? Are they educated enough to be able to go and get access to it? And so all the things that are necessary to teach people about the internet. There's the issue of access, meaning once I know I need it, is there infrastructure in place to go and get it? And then the third thing is, if I want to go get it, can I afford it? And those three things were the focus of the business, and we started work across all of them. Um, we have some great partners in the room with us today. Um, Tech Home uh, and the Boys and Girls Club, they've been excellent partners for us. Um, we have those nationwide in different places. They're doing a wonderful job educating the public, giving them access to capabilities to know how to avail themselves of help and support that's out there to educate and teach, to put hardware in hands. Those are our agents to do that, and we're trying to support them as much as we can, $2 billion over three years, with portions of that going to support those kind of initiatives. Probably no surprise to any of you, we build infrastructure. $24 billion a year of investment last year. We're building fiber networks uh, at a faster rate than anybody else in the United States. That fiber is gonna be really important down the road. We have scaled wireless networks that can also do this in some places. And then the third, third area is affordability. We offer a voluntary discount plan. It's called the ACP plan. And if you are qualified, about one third of US households can avail themselves of a $30 a month internet service from AT&T at 100 by 100, 100 megabits up, 100 megabits down. And then they can go turn back to the government and apply for a $30 subsidy. And I'm not really good at math, but you know, we charge them 30, they get a $30 subsidy. That means they have internet at home for no charge. And uh, we actively are you putting that program in place so that affordability dynamic is addressed with. And you know, the last place is we've been working really hard to shape policy. The Infrastructure Act that Congress passed, this one of the single largest appropriations was for broadband for all, all citizens of the United States. Um, there's about $50 billion teed up to build infrastructure where it doesn't exist today. Some of those are rural homes, some of those are urban homes. That money will be moved into the states and we will actively work on participating in that. And that policy, getting that legislation right, done the right way, was a key driver or something we spent a lot of time in cycles on. Yeah, I'm sure. And as you said, the Biden administration earmarking that $48 million, billion 
um, I'm sure you as well as your competitors are sort of going in there and trying to figure out how can you co-invest with them. And I'm sure there's been lots of challenges doing that. Uh, just curious how that process is. That's, it's a really good question. Um, you know, there, the way the federal government will work with this is the money got appropriated. It will now be pushed down to the states. And so all of you in this room should care about this. Your tax dollars that, you know, set up for that $50 billion will be pushed down to states based on a basis of need. So state comes up and says, here, I can prove this many people don't have internet. Please give me money to support this many people. The state gets the money. The state sets up policies and procedures of how to go find a public-private partnership to go solve this problem. And this public-private partnership thing is important. $50 billion will not solve this problem in the United States, sadly. It needs more. Good news is companies like mine are more than happy to invest money if we feel like we can get a return on it. The reason internet hadn't been built in these particular areas is just simply with what a customer can or will pay, there was no return to spend $3,000, $4,000 a home to build internet. Now what happens is with the government coming in and supporting some amount of that investment, I bring my private capital in, maybe $800, $1,000, $1,200 a home, just like I would in any other market to supplement with tax dollars to go in and build internet. And so that 50 billion, when it's all said and done, will probably be closer to 150 billion of investment, probably something along the lines of $100 billion of private capital matched with taxpayer money. And then hopefully the efficiency of the private market running and operating those networks in some way to make sure they're sustained and supported moving forward, paired with things like our voluntary affordable connection program for people to be able to get discounted internet so that they can get access. That's ideally how the policy should work. Now, each state has to come up with the right rules. And as you might guess, with 50 states, we're seeing you know, a couple different recipes being built. Um, there's some states that are you know, coming in and saying, we're only gonna build fiber to every home. And, and I gotta tell you, I don't know that it's probably the right thing as a taxpayer personally, that every farmhouse in the United States that may take 18, 19, dollars $20,000 to build fiber to it, that might not be the best place to put our tax money if we can serve it with a fixed wireless solution for dramatically less. Some states are coming in saying, we're gonna presuppose the amount of money that you're gonna put in per household as opposed to letting a competitive bid process start where companies compete against one another. That might not be the optimal way to do it. So. The long and short of it is, is you should pay attention to your state. You should pay attention to policies that are being applied. My point of view is you want the market to solve this. You want multiple competitors to come in and compete for effective use of that taxpayer money and pairing it with private capital and done right. We can, in fact, get every American connected to the internet over the next four or five years. Which is exactly what we want. And we don't want to get caught up in we the should. politics of trying yeah. to figure out how they allocate that. So. Uh, Good for you for pushing on that one. Um, just switching gears a little bit, uh, let's talk a little bit about diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, more and more companies are feeling unsure about where they should weigh in on a lot of issues that are there. Um, and I was just kind of curious in terms of your perspective, how do you guys address a lot of these issues around diversity, equity, and inclusion? Probably a bit surprising to me coming into my job, I've, I've spent a fair number of cycles on this. Maybe I didn't anticipate having to do that along with didn't anticipate a pandemic. Um, and I, I maybe have a slightly different take on this than, than some. And my take that I'm about ready to articulate, you could actually go out on our website and you, you could see this framework in place because um, my point of view is that this country does best when policies are centrist and are something that are accessible to the vast majority of the population. I wish I could say all the population, but I think we're getting to a point where we're so polarized in instances right now, it's, it's very difficult to get something that satisfies everybody, but we should be trying to satisfy most people. And as I think about the approach to this, and as I've had overt conversations with my employee body, um, I'm the mayor of at and I'm not the mayor of Los Angeles. I'm not the mayor of Boston. I'm the mayor of AT&T. 
And my job is to make sure that AT&T, when they come into work, is a good place for them to work. And unlike people who are in the political process, my business model is a little bit different. I'm not in the 51% business model. I don't keep my job on a vote of 51% of the employees. Um, my job is that 100% of the employees come into work and feel like that's a place they can belong, self-actualize, feel like they have a meaningful place for them to work, take satisfaction home from their work, and ultimately tell their friends and neighbors that this is a good place to come. And that we're responsible back to the community and the products and services that we offer and the role that we play. And for me, I would like all of you as a customer at some point in time. And I would suspect that all of you don't have the same points of view politically on every issue. And so you'll work that out with your elected representatives. You'll work that out with the people that you want to go and participate in that process. What my job is, is to make sure you have good connectivity and get on the internet and trust it and feel like you're getting a square deal for what you do. And what I owe to my employees is I owe for them an attractive place to come and work and continue to invest in the business and grow. And when they, the company grows, their careers grow, and that makes a good place to work. And I focus on policies that are directly, directly related to that objective. And that's where I will be vocal. Broadband policy is an important place for us and how public monies get deployed against it. I will be vocal and talk about that. There are other things. It would be really hard to say I'm an expert on how to do voting in 50 states and what the puts and takes of that are. And I think there are people who are better educated to do that and are more intimate with the issue. And so I've been pretty clear with my employee body, this is how I will approach it. And when I talk about diversity and inclusion, diversity means that at AT&T, we have a tent big enough for all points of view, that everybody can come in and work, not just some. And if an employee decides that that's not okay for them, that they need to be around people that very much think and look like them or act like them, that's a personal decision, but this may not be the right place for them. They may find another company that manages to deal with that dynamic for them better than AT&T does. But I need to be a place where everybody has a spot in the tent, that 100% of the people wanna support what the company does. And I have to discipline myself and the company's position and policy on things so that we have a healthy business, a healthy place, a healthy, a healthy tent, and then, Self-selection goes on with the employee body as to whether or not they can ascribe to that point of view and that approach. Yeah, I think it makes a lot of sense to you know, manage what you can control versus what you can't control. Um, on the ESG front, you know, leaders today are dealing with a lot of things that they didn't deal with 10 and 20 years ago. And um, just in terms of monitoring it, seeing what we can do differently, especially on climate change seems to be the hot topic. Um, what's AT&T doing around this? Oh, um, we care a lot about this. And you, you probably wouldn't intuitively jump to some of the reasons why we care about it. Um, you all know that there's unusual weather patterns occurring. My business gets dramatically impacted, <laughs> as do my customers by those unusual weather patterns. Um, we happen to be a you know, major infrastructure provider across the hurricane belt. We work actively in places where there's a lot of things like wildfires and windstorms and other things. And um, you probably don't think about it much until the day you wake up and something doesn't work. And then you understand the weather patterns impact our business pretty dramatically. And um, so we're paying a lot of attention to this, and not only for the fact that I've got to engineer the business differently and invest differently to have resilience, to do things like support our first net network, which in the state of Massachusetts is what fire departments and police departments use to ensure that they have communication all the time during public disasters and, and unrest and all the things that you would expect so that they can do their job effectively but also just so it works for each and every person as they're driving around in the middle of a, a natural disaster or some kind of stated emergency. So when you think about that, we've got to be active in planning, we have to be active in investing, and we care about these weather patterns because if suddenly we're in a situation where the average sea level rises a foot, and you think about all the infrastructure that we have on the ground, $24 billion a year, this is, these are hard assets. They're 
their pieces of electronics, their generators, their, and suddenly they're you know, going to get flooded, things aren't gonna work. And then you have to go around and raise every cell site six feet off the ground so the water table doesn't get into the equipment. You have to do all kinds of crazy things. So that's, that's one of the motivations for us to care about this. Second part is, I'm gonna you know, be candid with you, we're a large consumer of energy takes a lot of energy to run our networks and do what we need to do. Um, that's a cost and input costs of that are going up. I'd like to drive it down and use less because it's responsible. It's also better for the products and services that you buy from me. If I can spend less money buying energy, it means my prices are gonna be better out in the market. Um, technologies that we deploy that can help us on this optical fiber is great, it's passive. Copper requires a lot of energy, you know, to get communications down it. So what we're doing and refreshing our network and taking infrastructure out of service and getting infrastructure in place where we don't have to cool it all day long to keep it working, harden it so that it can stand higher temperatures and you don't have to run air conditioning in a building all the time. Using solar power as the backup to be able to charge batteries and keep networks up and running. We have an objective that by 2035, we're gonna be carbon neutral. And it comes from a variety of things. We're probably number six on the list in the United States of buying energy through renewables. We're also trying to use a lot less energy each and every day through our engineering approaches, how we're managing the network, what we do with our fleet and our vehicles. And then finally, teaching people how to use our network to take carbon out of their businesses. Um, you know, I'll just give you a very simple example. You can intuitively understand the air quality in a lot of urban cities got better during the pandemic, right? Because people were working from home. They were spending less time in their cars. They were doing more things electronically. I had to invest in power and energy to get people services, but we took cars off the road. There are all kinds of plays using telecommunications infrastructure where I might invest in networking capability to ultimately make somebody else a less significant producer of carbon that we can use our technology for. And that's the third pillar that we are, we're focused on. That's great, thank you. Um, <clears throat> we're gonna open it up to the audience for questions in just a moment. I'm just gonna ask one more question and then you can start thinking about any questions that you might have. So my question for you is, you're going through a significant transformation initiative right now trying to get the company ready for where you want to take it in the next 10 years and beyond. And I know you've been focusing on efficiency and effectiveness as well. Maybe you can talk a little bit about what that transformation looks like. Yeah, I, again, if I kind of pull away from AT&T and think about any peer of mine that is leading a, you know, a, a legacy Fortune 500 company that wasn't built in the era of free money, is that, is that a good way to describe it? They had a business, you know, before the year 2005. Uh, they had infrastructure and investment. Their business models were a little bit older and their customer base and products were built in a different time and energy. I think all of us in some way, shape or form are stepping back, looking at our businesses saying things have changed pretty dramatically and we all have to think quite a bit differently about how we operate and run our business. And at and is no exception to that. And part of the reason um, I went down the path I did on refocusing the business solely on providing connectivity over fiber and wireless is because I felt like in today's day and age, customers and customer expectations were, they were getting conditioned to only having great products, very easy to use products with very little friction. Uh, and you think about the great relationships any of you have in your personal life and the brand that comes to mind, you say, oh, I just love working with that company. I suspect it's going to have those characteristics because they're gonna be very customized to you. It's gonna be very easy for them to do business with. They're gonna bring you a product or service that's very unique to what you do. And you are going to expect that of all your relationships moving forward. AT&T has to become that company. And I, I realize that we are far off that mark at the moment and have to make that transition to in fact become a beloved company that you look at and say, gosh, this is where I wanna to go to get my internet access because it's easy and I can depend on it and they understand who I am and treat me the right way. That's the transformation that's going on and that means we gotta shut down a lot of old products and services that are no longer relevant. That means we need 
infrastructure to go away that's too costly to operate so that we can hit price points in the market that the customer's willing to pay for. That means distribution channels and how you get the product need to be less cumbersome with less friction in them and more on the terms of what the customer wants. I don't know why customers need to go to a retail store to get a phone. You know, why didn't show up on your front porch? You know, why don't you go pick it up someplace where it's convenient for you? I mean, there's all kinds of ways we can do this, right? And so that transformation is really geared around that premise. And, um, you know, every CEO comes in and takes a job and you have to kind of think about what your chapter is. You know, you're just, if it's a quilt, you're just one little tile on the quilt. You want a nice, attractive quilt for the company. We all have quilts that are large, history, great legacy. You probably walked into your job and said, what's my chapter going to look like? What is my 10-year legacy going to be? John Stanky's chapter at at and will be the, it was the repositioning era for the next 10 years, for the, the next individual who comes in and will run that business that I just described and take it to a new level. And uh, that's what the transformation is. And it touches every aspect of the business, every aspect, employee training, information systems, product definitions, and um, it's not for the faint of heart. No, well, it sounds like you're on the right path. So congratulations. Let's hope. (laughs) Questions from the audience. There are mics around. So let's see a few hands up, one here, one there. John, thank you for making it to Boston today. I was actually in Dallas uh, two weeks ago, and I saw AT&T's headquarters, and I think that there are some people there that think that that might be the center of the universe. So (laughs) if anybody hasn't seen it, it's uh, very impressive, and uh, it's worth seeing. But It's um, it's the most digitally photographed place in Dallas in social media, if you can believe it. It's absolutely mind-boggling. You find yourself standing there and just kind of head on a swivel seeing what you have done to that space. It's incredible. I don't know downtown. if that makes it the center of the universe, but it's, it's present on social media. So. <laughs> center of something. Um, regardless, um, <clears throat> you had exceptional results in 2022. You more than doubled you know, your expectations on what you were going to do with 5G. You made tremendous progress with FirstNet and fiber installations across the United States, strong cash flow. Uh, strong revenues. I'm wondering if you think that 2023, or rather that was 2022, I'm wondering if 2023 and beyond, you feel like you're gonna be able to have similarly sustainable growth in the, uh, in the coming years. Yeah, we do expect sustainable growth in 23, and we've, we've given guidance to that regard and I expect growth in cash flows, which is probably the most important thing because it's the growth in cash flows that allow me to continue to reinvest at the incredible rate that we're investing. We're doing about 20% of revenues and reinvestment in our business right now. So 20% of our revenues go back into capital infrastructure that we're investing. Just to give you a sense, probably historically, 15-ish percent, maybe in a high year would have been 16%. Dramatically higher investment levels because of these fundamental changes that we see happening in society that require great high-performance connectivity. So um, we intend to continue to do that because of the expected growth. I'm going to temper that a bit. We're all in a bit of a... a bit of a hum going on. Can you maybe knock that down a bit? The volume on the microphone. Thank you. Um, The dynamics that are going on right now in the economy, I expect growth is probably going to be a little bit softer late this year, if not flat to negative. Um, And I've expected that. I've said that publicly. Um, We've planned for that. We still think there's great growth in our industry as a result of that. But look, I I think we should expect that we're going to be in a little bit of uncertain territory economically. If you're in my position, you want to be in a little bit more defensive mode, given what's going on right now. Um, and I, I think you're going to see that probably broadly across industry, generally speaking. But I still think inherently we're in a great place because guess what? Even though the economy may temper a little bit, you're all going to use 40% more data next year than you use this year. And you're going to need to go someplace to get it. And I intend to be there to try to make sure you have a place to get it. That's another question over here. Hi, Ed. 
So great to meet you, uh, John. Welcome to Boston. Uh, as a former police commissioner, with my colleague here, Kathy O'Toole, who preceded me in that job, uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't say a little bit more about the FirstNet network. Um, I responded to 9-11. I worked on, on the pile in the, in the shadow of the AT&T building. Um, I, I managed the response here to the Boston Marathon 10 years after that. And in the last 10 years, as a result of congressional hearings um, and, and a lot of direction from the uh, federal government, they've recognized communications and data as a huge problem for your safety in the communities across the United States. And so uh, your company um, proceeded to respond to an RFP and win the, uh, win the award for the build out of a broadband wireless uh, data and voice network uh, nationwide. And in the last uh, five years, it's been incredible the progress that you've made here. So because of what I experienced, I wanna say thank you for your commitment to public safety for everybody in this room. And the question I have is, how do you see that network evolving over the next few years as the uh, adoption becomes more uh, prolific? Yeah, so, Ed, we appreciate the support. It's not only come from yourselves, but other key leaders in the public safety community that have been great stewards and, frankly, mentors guiding us in this journey. It's, it's had its fits and starts to get here. When you think, to your point, this original appropriation was done shortly after 9-11. And so this journey started back at the time of 9-11. It took this long to get to the point of money working through the system, private capital again coming in to invest, to build an infrastructure and ultimately get it up and running where, you know, now we're at a point where two and a half million public safety folks are using the system day in and day out. And I think we're in the early days. I, maybe we're getting to adolescence, maybe we're still in um, you know, childhood, I'm not sure. We're probably somewhere in the cusp of that. The base infrastructure is in, but now, as you know, many of the clients that are using it are just starting to think about what they can do with it now to actually enhance public safety in ways that we hadn't imagined before. Um, you know, something as simple, for example, of what we're all becoming accustomed to is body cams, and we see how that's changed things. And now you think about networking cameras in public safety and in civic environments on traffic signals and streets and what that can do to manage crime and public safety and those types of things. All that needs a network to back it up and to ride on. And the better you get at using software and AI and augmented reality capabilities that allow public safety to do the things that they can do well, for example, a fireman who goes in with the helmet on and the screen who wants to go into a building that they've never been in, they don't know whether they should turn right or left down a hall, a public safety network that can display the floor plan for them, can save lives, make them more effective, ultimately you know, achieve objectives that we couldn't do before. I think we're just getting into that next chapter now. And so what has to happen is the investment in infrastructure needs to continue. This is a good lesson for what we talked about with broadband deployment and the public-private partnership. We're in another investment cycle for FirstNet because those capabilities that I talk about need the next generation of technology. And they need somebody who's going to invest in it for them. And, and we're gonna end up doing that. We're gonna put several billion dollars more into the FirstNet network to do that trusting that in fact public safety will find applications and ultimately want to use them and pay for them. The same thing occurs in any technology deployment. There's refresh cycles that have to occur. It's why you want capable, uh, reputable, strong balance sheet companies to do this kind of stuff. So I think we're about ready to launch into the next chapter. I think we've proven we can put the infrastructure out there. I think people have seen the fact that they have a purpose-built network that it can help their their operation, their mission. Um, <clears throat> they like the customization that comes with it for their needs. It's now got to have more applications built on it to put even more value in it. And I think we're about ready to see that. And we're gonna help and try to facilitate that in any way we can. That's yeah. Right. yeah. Uh, time for one more question. Oh, Jean.
Yeah, the question for those who didn't hear it is what's happening with global supply chains and what's changed since the pandemic and what's happening with the geopolitics around it. They're nothing like they used to be and they're gonna change more. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know that I'm gonna break any news to any of you, but globalization will now become regionalization. And in my industry, I can you know state very specifically, it's always something we were pretty careful about um, because we do things like support public safety and government installations, we had to be very mindful of our supply chain and where we sourced equipment from and chips and infrastructure. That's not new to us. But we've even gone through a further cycle of um, there's going to be a lot more manufactured within North America, and there'll be probably a much stronger trading relationship between North America and Europe than there has historically been when this all shakes out. And most every company that we source from right now is reorienting themselves in some way, shape, or form around that. I could give you example after example. Uh, Texas Instruments, which provides a lot of the silicon that goes into telecommunications, infrastructure gear. I never thought I'd see a fab being built in Richardson, Texas. Um, there is another fab being built in Richardson, Texas right now, and it will source a lot of the silicon that goes into equipment that I buy through my OEMs like Ericsson and, and Nokia Siemens and, and those kinds of companies. And so it's completely reordering, but this is not a short stint to make this happen. In some cases, the roadmaps we're looking at for volume to move from market A to market B maybe coming out of places in Asia to go to North America is five and six years. And um, I know my business, and you all have complexities in your business, that five or six year thing makes me uneasy when I look at the geopolitical dynamics around here. You're all reading about what's going on with China and what might happen. And you know, China interrupting things in Taiwan will not be Russia interrupting things in Ukraine. It'll be a different dynamic and it will be a, a much harder dynamic. And we should all care about that. We should all pay attention to that. We should all be on the clock about that. And every year that we make progress in sourcing capability and balancing out what occurs in Asia for key components of the infrastructure that runs your life every day, um, the more continuity and the safer we will all be over time. And that's that's the major issue in my in my business and in my industry right now. Well, thank you so much. I've it's been very fascinating to hear you talk, and we all wish you the best in the future as well. So I really you. appreciate your attention, and thanks for inviting me in for a really pleasant Friday afternoon. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.